and we are ready to rock and roll. Jen, welcome to the There Is No Try podcast. I am so happy to have you here. So for our guests at home, uh, Jen, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and, and I'll kind of kick it off and then I want you to take it home. So mega fitness competitor, um, all around badass and <laughs> really spent a lot of time uncovering what makes something aesthetically beautiful or questioning more specifically why we find something aesthetically beautiful is maybe a better way to say that. But let me, let me turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I actually am a pro athlete. So I'm an IFBB pro figure competitor. I've been competing now for about six years, wow. but, um, I was a single mom for a long time, raising the sun and opening up my own first skincare clinic. And then, um, working through that and then actually, you know, getting married, raising kids that weren't my own stepkids <laughs> and then building a really good skin clinic. And then, um, honestly I went through a major divorce and had to build back up. And that's pretty much, um, the logist of everything. And my <laughs> dog is like, <laughs> um, so just building, you know, building the clinics up and, and pretty much training girls and with doing all of that, competing on top of it, um, that's just been my livelihood. And now I'm actually building up some skincare brands. So I have a men's line that I just launched and I have a woman's line, but I'm refiguring that and that is coming out here soon. And so my next turn will be more um, training Mm -hmm. and educating people. So, um, and, and this is a, a good segue because we spend a lot of time talking with entrepreneurs and um, people that are successful entrepreneurs, people that are in the middle of growing their business. You know, we, we talked with a, a, a person who owns a men's fashion line in Laguna Beach, probably not all that, that uh, far away. And he, and he started his company a few days before COVID hit and, you know, the trials and tribulations of, okay, I opened up this boutique and now everything's shut down. Right. So we've talked to sort of all ends of the spectrum in different parts of that journey. And so this is going to be a great conversation for us uh, to dig into all those different parts. So let's start at the, uh, the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Where are you from? So um, I grew up with a single mom. Okay. And um, my mom got divorced when I was three years old and from my dad. And so I grew up in California. So mainly in the like close to San Francisco, but more near Napa area is where mm -hmm. I grew up. And um, just single mom with two kids, you know, busted her ass raising us. And, um, you know, definitely have went through a couple marriages when she was married and uh, or she went through two marriages while I was, you know, little mm -hmm. and then, um, just grew up through there. And then we ended up bucking heads when I was probably about 15, 16, <laughs> moved in with my father and, um, got a taste of being with my dad and living with my dad. And, um, I got married when I was 19. I had my son when I was 21 and um, not the best relationship to be in and divorce after three years. Um, so a little abusive, not, not um, more verbally abusive and had to pull myself out of that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it definitely was a struggle but I think it's made me who I am. And with my son, I mean, raising him on my own. I mean, I worked my ass off in the clinic um, that I was working at. So um, when I was pregnant, I was going through school. I had my son and I graduated right when I had my son. So I got a job right away and it was in a skin clinic and it was a German lady who was just a straight hard ass. <laughs> but I, I love that. I love the fact of, um, I love the fact that people are very blunt. They'll tell you exactly what it is. You, there's no black gray areas anywhere. And um, working with her and cleaning houses on the other days that I wasn't working just to make ends meet. I mean, that's how I did it. 
I, I love the hustle. Off. I, I love it. Yeah. I, I love it because a person in your position, there are there are other ways that you can provide and going for handouts can be tempting. And my parents probably would have given it to me if I asked. Going to the government would have been an option, right? Um, but ultimately, does that build you into the person that you want to be? No, not that, at all. Right, exactly. But it's harder, right? Like it's it's easy to say that now. Yeah. It's much harder to say, say that back then. Yeah. Right. So, so I applaud you for that, but, I, but I'd also like to coax out and say that the, the people who are successful in business and, and ultimately reach higher levels of success are the same people who have that type of wiring that go, no, I know I could go get a handout, but I'm not interested. I got to do this for me. I got to build it for me. And by doing that learns the skill, the grit, the tenacity that they put into their business. Absolutely. Um, so during that time, you know, feel free to share as little or as much as you'd like. How are you staying? The, the, the pressure is definitely on, right? As a mom going through a divorce, making ends meet, working your, your tail off. Like there's a, that's a bit of a pressure cooker, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How are you staying focused through that process? It was about my son. That's all it was. It was, um, I had to provide for him. I wanted him to have the best life. I didn't want him to grow up in a house that he was in for three years. And um, I, I didn't want, I just wanted the best for him. So it was sure. mainly, I, I just rolled up my sleeves and did what I had to do to make sure that I knew that his adolescent years were the most important years and influential years of his life. And I didn't want him to see all the chaos that was in the house prior. And um, I mean, even if I had to, to work, I don't know, in fast food or whatever else on, an, right. on another day or do what, I mean, I would do whatever I had to do to make ends meet, to mm -hmm. provide for him. So, I mean, I worked and it's nothing against our school systems by any means, but I mean, I worked my ass off enough to be able to put him into a private school. I mean, we barely made ends meet, <laughs> um, but I wanted to make sure that he had that background and he wasn't going to the school where we lived at at the point because it wouldn't have been a great environment for him. Right. And so for me, I would rather sacrifice what I have to make sure that he can have a better life. That's right. So one of the truthisms, as I like to say, that in interviewing all these amazing people that we've had on the show, and um, one of those things is finding your motivation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and we're going to get into this, you become a pro athlete because the amount of discipline that that takes to eye and exercise the regime of it all, the science of it all is, is tremendous. Um, but the motivation and finding your motivation is critical. So let me give everyone an example. If I said, um, wherever you're standing right now, I need you to walk to Mexico. Might be a pretty far walk, right? That doesn't sound like a, a good time. It's might be hundreds of miles for some of our listeners, thousands of miles for what that, that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Well, um, walk to Mexico, I'll give you a million dollars. They go, mm, some people, mm, okay, maybe it's kind of hard. It's hot. It's dusty. You can't hop in a car. You can't hop in a plane. Got to walk. Okay. If you don't get to Mexico, someone's going to injure your mother. Someone's going to injure your, your child. Someone, right. And suddenly they go, I can get to Mexico now. Are you kidding me? Right. So there's an interesting thing that happens with the brain in which we rationalize certain outcomes are said differently. If we put different levels of motivation in place, we are capable of, of amazing things. So for you to, 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 to make it back to your story, the temptation for you to take an easier road was there, but because of your motivation, your motivation being your son, right? I came from this, this sucked. I won't have him involved in experiencing any of that. I will work my tail off, not for me, but for him, because that's my motivation is protecting my child. For all of us that are trying to build a business, trying to have a happier marriage, whatever it is, 
figuring out that piece, what that little motivational tick is, it's sort of a trick you play on yourself is one of the most powerful things. Okay, so you're working at the clinic, um, you're working your tail off. How do you get from there to building a business and becoming a pro athlete, which is like the most disciplined thing in the world? Like, I don't, I don't get it. You got, I, I need more, I need more details. So um, with working there, I was working there for about, oh gosh, three or four years. And the owner and I become really good friends. I mean, I mean, I ran that joint. And so she said, you know, hey, it's about time for me to retire. Do you want to take the business over? And I said, absolutely. And um, she, she would pretty much just said, well, my only concern is, you know, you have a son. Can you give this 100%? And I said, I would absolutely give it 100%. There's no reason why my son can't come with me if he needs to. And so anyway, long story short is um, I qualified for a first time um, woman owned. But the reason why I did is because I actually bought the property and the business at the same time. Smart. So thankfully I had great friends around me and they loaned me the down payment to buy the property and the business. So I took that over and I worked, I mean, I, I worked hard and got more people in there and um, I, I did really well. I mean, exceptional. That's and awesome. that, that ran for about seven years and um then the uh, market hit and as being 24 and opening the business and buying it and doing everything, I've never, my parents have never been into business. They don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So I knew nothing about having to run a business successfully at right. all. I mean, I had a great business. If I were to have somebody that would teach me, it would be different, but I knew nothing. And so when that market hit, I lost everything. So I had to claim bankruptcy, walk away from my property, my business, and my condo that I bought for my son and I. And um, thankfully, I had amazing clients and they owned several pieces of property in commercial real estate. So he literally put me up in a whole brand new place and built it out for me Wow! to move over. And to restart all over again. Sure. So that's what I did. <laughs> so one of the, yeah, that's amazing. Let's, let's put a pin in that for one second. That's amazing. Um, but it shows the value of relationships and building a network. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, another, another truthism that comes up all the time is building a network that can help you um, in the future. The future could be 70 years from now or seven months from now. You never really know. Um, and one of the ways that you build a network is to give with no expectation of return. Because oftentimes you'll give to one person and it comes back to you in some weird way that you never would have expected yeah. um, because it's it's not a, a, a quid pro quo, Right. I give you, you give me back. That's not what the, that's not what it is. And so if you as a person um, in your mind go, well, I gave you something. I was nice to you. I gave you this thing. Therefore, you owe me. You're going to fail right out of the jump. It's not going to work. But if you just give and give and give and by give, I don't mean just money. Give, I mean time. I mean lending someone your ear, advice, help, uh, referring people together, right? connecting great people with other great, great people. All of those things can help broaden your network so that when there are critical moments, critical moments could be such as you, you're in a time of need. Other times it's a great business opportunity that you, you don't have the funding for or whatever. There's lots of different reasons why that comes together, but building that is so critical in terms of long-term success. I don't care if you're Warren Buffett or you're a person starting today, mm -hmm. that it's valuable on both ends. Okay. So you move into this new space. So if, if you don't mind sharing about the 2008, 2009 crisis, so you were a good, um, you were good at your job, but there is a difference between being an operator, mm -hmm. right. And there, and being good at your job. Mm -hmm. right? People yeah. went to you because of you. Yep. They went, they didn't go to your business. They went to you, right? Yeah. You were the commodity. Yeah. Right. 
Um, and being a good business person is a completely different skill set. Um, and that if you're a great business person, I can run a nail shop just as well as I can run a restaurant, just as well as I can run a hardware store because I know the business side. That doesn't mean I know anything about running a restaurant or a hardware store, right? It, it has to do with that piece. That doesn't mean that people are going to go out of their way to come to my shop, though. That's what you're good at. And it, smart business has both, right? Absolutely. So did you struggle in 2008, 2009? Obviously, because clients stopped coming because they were going through stuff. Yeah. Was it because, you know, you had increases in costs? Like what, what, what drove those, those decisions? So with buying the business and the property, I bought everything for close to almost a million dollars and I paid everything off except for the property. So the sure. property was worth, um, I'm sorry, my dog's acting out. Um, of course he's going to do it right now. The property was worth 650,000. And when the economy tanked, my property was only worth 230,000. That's so crazy. I mean, that's, that's it insane. Like, oh yeah. And it was horrible because it was, you know, I could make, um, I can make those payments. Sorry. Right. I don't know what is wrong with him. Come here. Um, I could make the payments, but it was pretty much asinine to make payments on a property that you probably won't ever turn around, you know, for what? 15 years, if that. Right. So um, the clientele definitely diminished a little bit, but you know what? I, I work my, I shouldn't say I work my butt off. I actually care about people and I want the best for them. So right. with building my business, I built more um, of relationships with them. You know, they were more my family and they still are to this day. And um, so for me, it was almost like, they came in to support me no matter what. So with moving my business to a whole different um, place, I, I didn't really lose too many clients. It was just letting go of all the baggage of the property. Totally so, makes sense. I, I, yeah. a, a quick story about relationships. So uh, a buddy of mine, Russ, um, he has been a financial advisor, a very, very su successful financial advisor for Morgan Stanley for his entire career, right? So Russ is, gosh, Russ is over 60 now. Um, so he's been at Morgan Stanley for 30 years, okay? 30, 35 years. Very successful guy, big book of business. He has a client call him and go, Russ, I got a buddy of mine I want to refer to you. He's a very wealthy guy. He needs your help managing his money, but I can't find you on the Merrill Lynch website. I've been, I've been looking all day and Russ goes, I've never worked at Merrill Lynch. I've only worked at Morgan Stanley. What are you talking about? So the point of this story is that this client had been with him for so long. It didn't matter where he hung his shingle. It yep. mattered zero because to this guy, it was Russ. Russ is the guy. Everything else doesn't matter because he had a deep relationship. Yes. So much to the point that this guy didn't even know where his money was. He literally didn't know that his money was not at Merrill, that it was at Morgan yeah. because he trusted with Russ, yeah. right? Like that's, and you built that with your client base and, and people have to understand that is incredibly, incredibly valuable. A quick side note, everybody stop listening to this podcast for one second. Google a thousand true fans, a thousand true fans. Uh, it is a very famous piece, not written by me, <laughs> people far smarter than I am, about how you can build a business, any business, if you have a thousand true fans. And it's, it's a really fascinating look at consumer behavior and connecting with people. I digress. Okay, so when do you decide to, to just double down into the discipline and go, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to become a, a, a competitor. Cause that's before, crazy. Before I, before I walked away from my business, um, it probably about six months before everything happened, I actually got remarried. So I was dating somebody for about two years and then we got married and he had two kids. And then I had my son. And so 
with that, I thought, okay, you know what? I have support at home. I'm going to really start working on my physical appearance or not appearance, but I mean, get rid of some of that body weight that I had from my son. So I really started working out and randomly somebody came up, Hey, you should do a show. And I'm like, show what's a show. And so I looked into a show and just like myself, I need like a goal. If I know I have a goal, I'm going to get my ass to do it. And if I'm going to sit on stage in a bikini, I know that I'm going to look my best, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he was um, a great motivator. Yeah. So I was like, well, I'm going to do it because it's going to make me get there. Right. And um, this is the turn of going through my second divorce is that um, I got no support whatsoever at home over this at all. Hmm. And so it's a repetition that I have gotten into my life about relationships, you know, and you say you, te- you seem to get into the same relationship that you're comfortable with. Correct. And that's something that's a life lesson that I've had to learn. And um, so getting into that relationship, if somebody tells me not to do something, I'm going to do it 10 times more now because that's just who I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, um, I went ahead and started getting ready for my first show, which was actually a bikini show. And I did my first NPC show and I placed 12th out of 29 girls. And I thought, Oh, I want to do another show after this, but bikini wasn't my style. I'm not one to flaunt and shake and it's just not who I am. And so I thought I'm going to bump myself up a little bit and do a figure show. So I actually got a trainer, started working to do a figure show. And meanwhile, all of this, I'm opening up my new shop on okay. top of that. And um, so started, um, then did my second show and I placed uh, third at- uh, a big improvement. Show. So I placed third out of all of the girls. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. And at that, it, I was- 34 or 35, I think it was. So I could qualify to go to the masters to get my pro card. And I said, I'm going to do it. No, nobody being very positive about this whatsoever. You know, it was very insecure um, relationship. So anyway, I decided, well, I'm going to do it anyway. If you want to come join me more the merrier. Um, And I flew to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I remember stepping on stage and thinking, okay, just give it your all. And they called out everybody and they called me second. And I remember thinking in my head, this is your only chance. This is the only chance you have to get first place. You won't get this again. And so I just did exactly what my coach said in my head. They switched me over to, to first and I placed first and I got my pro car on my second show. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. That's yeah. absolutely like, that's so intense. So for people describe a little bit for people on the amount of discipline that you have to have in order to get to that point. Like, what are you eating? How much are you sleeping? How much are you training? Like it, 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 it's yeah, it's insane. It's so hard. And my son, it seemed that like every show I did, even after my pro card, it seemed like every show about three to four weeks before a show, something majorly happened at the house. Like right before I got my pro card, um, he broke every single bone in his foot at the skate park. So I was up every two hours giving him medicine, plus doing all of my workouts, my eating, my prepping, going to work and working 12 hour days on top of it. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, and I did that. I'm so sorry. He is just, working. I did that for, um, gosh, a good three, four years. Wow. And then, um, I took a break when I moved in after I got my pro card, I took a break when I, um, when I, my new shop you know when I got all of that in there I took a break after I won my pro card for a little bit but then I went to the Arnold Australia yeah (laughs) that's so crazy so I was just listening to some fitness competitors talking about 
dehydration and water before they go on stage, how they try to get all the water out of their skin, right? So they have that sort of vacuum sealed look, much more important um, than people would realize, right? It's managing water and salt and all of these things. It, it, the level of prep is hard for people to really understand. You're just working out nonstop, worried about everything that goes into your body, including water, right? It's just, it's, it's, that level of discipline, did that keep you sane during this difficult time? Yes. It was almost like, um, it was almost like I needed to compete to keep my um, being in marriages and things like that, that I wasn't very happy with. It was almost like that was, that was my outlook in life. That's sure. what got me motivated. I mean, that and my son, of course, I mean, I right. was always involved, but um you know, that was, that was my drive, my work, my competing and my son. I mean, that's really, that's what it was. Wow. But, um, I have a better story going forward with yes. the and the show. So I decided after I took a little bit of break from competing that again, I needed to, to deal with my son and I, and I wasn't happy where I was. And so I decided to, um, leave my husband at that time. That was after, gosh, we were married about eight years, nine years, I think. A good amount of time. Yeah. And, um, so with doing that, I decided to merge my practice in with a medical clinic on top of it. So I was going to be merging my practice to start offering more clinical services and I'm going through a divorce. And I put in for the Arnold Australia probably two months before um, I walked away from my husband. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really think I would get it because I don't know, I just didn't think I was. Well, two months of living in, on my own and starting to close the shop down and going through a horrible divorce, I got accepted for the Arnold Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Life has a funny way of teaching us things, doesn't right? it? Right? Yes. So um, I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. So I started prepping for the Arnold Australia with doing it all. And um, it was really bad. Our divorce was really, really bad. I haven't been through one. Or I should, that sounds horrible, right? My second <laughs> divorce. Um, but to the point to where even my son was extremely upset with me. And I... Um, everybody, everybody walked away from me at that point. My son did. Um, a lot of people that were friends and family, um, because everything looks pretty imperfect outside, but people, people don't realize what's going on in, in the house and inside. Right. And, um, it was a really hard time for me. And with losing my son and watching him walk away, and watching my parents ask me why I'm doing what I was doing. Um, I just dug in deep and said, you know what, I'm going to do the Arnold Australia because that's the only thing I know how to focus on. Hold on. Yep. And I focused on that and merging my skin clinic. And literally three weeks before going to the Arnold Australia, I came down with shingles. So, so would you say that that was that moment in your life where, where it was, you were under the most weight, right? Like that's where things are just, it's difficult to breathe is, is the way I describe it, right? It's, it's hard to breathe when you're in that moment. Um, from that point, how, what are you thinking about sort of mentally and emotionally that, that you're taking your steps day by day we're, we're, so we, we've led you to the bottom here, this thing, it, you've got this weight on you. Things are not going the way that you envisioned. They're difficult, but you didn't stay there. And, and, and the, the point I'm trying to get to here is that for many people, when, when the pressure builds and you, it feels like you can't breathe, it is, you are the most susceptible to make bad decisions in that moment. Mm -hmm. You didn't make bad decisions and that is commendable and why I wanted to talk to you because now is where we can start talking about the small steps that you took to build back up and out from, from that spot. Okay, so 
give me the next steps. You came down with shingles, which is very painful if, if people are not aware. Yeah, it was about, it was about three or four weeks before my show to Australia, I came down with shingles. And even my coach at that time, um, he said, no, you're not doing the Arnold. This is horrible. You cannot right. do it. I said, what else do I have to live for? I said, my son isn't even around anymore. He left. I said, nobody's speaking to me half the time. I'm, I'm going to do whatever I want to. If I die, then I die. At least I know that I made it to the Arnold, right? Right. And <laughs> I like that. I like that. So I, I did it. And my mom, she was so cute. She's like, you are not going to Australia by yourself. And so she booked a flight with me and we flew down to Australia. And, um, I remember going to the gym before leaving to Australia, just in tears working out because it was so painful. I would work out and I didn't have any money again because I just went through, I left him and I said, you can have everything. I just want out of it. So I was living in a little apartment and working seven days a week again. So I was working plus having the shingles plus training, getting ready for the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's awful. but I went there and you know what? I wasn't my best. But out of all of the girls, I placed 11th place. And That's I was tremendous. so proud of myself for just saying, you know what, I'm not going to give up and I'm going to push through it and I'm going to do this. And um, I, when I was done with that and coming back, that was my time that I needed to focus on me and get myself healthy. Because mm -hmm. obviously I, in my life, made bad choices in relationships. Um, which I wasn't, I mean, I didn't grow up with great relationships watching, you know, mm -hmm. like my parents. So it was something that I had to deal with myself. And so I did a lot of soul searching and with merging my clinic, it freed up a lot of time and it freed mm -hmm. up some money. And I traveled, I went to Greece, I went to Thailand. Um, I really just focused on getting me back to where I needed to be. And that I took about two years doing, doing that. Wow. That's a long time. Yeah. That's great. I say about a year and a half, almost to two years. Yeah. And then my son moved in with his father and, um, was living with him. Now as a mother raising a son, I never got child support ever. Right. I raised him on my own. And, um, meanwhile, his dad filed for, um, me to pay for child support. So I was paying child support. But one day I got a phone call from my son and he was in tears and he said, I want to come home. And I knew that when he left, I was making the right decision and that I didn't fight him to stay because for some reason, like my whole insides were telling me this is what he needs right now. Sure. And um, I went and picked him up and he literally was skin and bones. His dad was really not feeding him because he said he didn't have money. And I picked him up, brought him back home. And within about a week, that kid put on 20 pounds. <laughs> and I, to this day, I still get letters of how an amazing mother I am. So the reason why I say that is because when things happen in your life and you don't realize that you, every single wall is falling down around you and everything you've lived for is not working out, that there's a reason down the road why this happens. My son and I are like the best of friends and he's an amazing kid. That's amazing. And um, That's so, so going through that, it all worked out. I mean, mm -hmm. I it, it all, you, you know, good always prevails over evil. Right. And so with going forward, I started building back up my skincare clinics again. And, um, now I sit with two clinics. I, um, met somebody and we've been together for two years and we own an electrical company together and we're both hard workers, same exact mindset. And my son works for our electrical company. So we've went from three employees when we first started, when we first met, mm -hmm. and now we're up to 41 employees. Wow. 
That is tremendous. So, you know, hard work prevails. We all fall and it's all about learning and moving on. And honestly, it's just about being a good person and just trusting yourself. So that, that is an amazing story. And I, and I want to add a little bit to the credibility in, of the words that you just said and how true that they are. So my, my, I have a dear friend of mine named Kevin, Kevin Marshall. I'm going to put him on blast right now. Kevin Marshall uh, is the founder of a company called Clear Capital. Clear Capital is an enormously successful uh, company. They have 400 plus employees in Reno, plus thousands of reps across the United States. They are a massively successful company. He is a very wealthy and very successful person. And I asked him one day, I said, Kevin, how did you build such a successful business? Like, this is amazing. How did you do that? And, and they, have, they have to do with um, real estate evaluations. That they, they make valuation of commercial real estate. Um, and he looked at me, he kind of pondered for a second and he goes, just don't be a dick. He goes, just be nice to people. You just don't have to be an asshole. And you know what? Generally, if you treat people pretty well, you're probably going to do pretty good in business because other people aren't going to treat them so well and they're going to come back to you. And I said, well, hold on, hold on. You built a multi-billion billion with a B dollar business and your advice is, quote, don't be a dick. And I remember he told me this in my driveway. I remember it like it was yesterday. And, I, and he's like, yeah, no, that's 100% it, right? And so building a successful business, everybody, you, you don't have to be Elon Musk, okay? That, you, you don't. Um, you, you, you have to wake up every day and work hard and do a good job and be a good person and not take advantage of people or rip people off. And lo and behold, if you do that enough times in a row, repeat, 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 yeah. Like you, which is why I wanted you on the show, you wake up and go, oh, look at that. I have employees and clients and I have a real business here, yeah. right? It's, it's amazing what can happen if you can stack all those things together. But part of that, and maybe you know this or maybe you don't, comes from your discipline of training. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like you could have had one great day of diet and one great day of working out. What does that mean? Nothing. It's mm-hmm. zero. One day is worth zero because you need to do one day every day for months on end in order to, to compete. Exactly. Right? Um, okay. So you've built up this electric company, but then you said, I don't have anything else going on. I might as well go ahead and start skincare line. Right. Like you're <laughs> like, I'm not busy enough. I've got employees and clients. I'm running around. Well, like you know crazy. What? I'm not really competing anymore. Right? <laughs> yes. I have anything to keep me active. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, well, I have the two skincare clinics and um, I, I love skincare. I mean, I've been doing it for 21 years and, you know, I see so much BS out there with, with people pushing product lines and pushing things. And I'm an ingredient junkie too. So I'm a nutrition junkie and an ingredient junkie. So if you give me protein and you say, what, what do you think about this protein? Well, I will look through all of the ingredients and I... I will divvy it out of what I think is great, what is not great. And then, you know, I'll go over it all. Well, I'm the same with skincare. So I teach my clients basically about being healthy creates good skin. It's not so much what you're putting on it, which it is because I don't want you to go use Vaseline on your skin, but it's about um, teaching people the proper things that you should be doing to your skin because I'm 41 years old and I don't, I mean, yeah, I get Botox and I get a little bit of filler and things like that, but I've never had any surgery whatsoever. And, um, I don't think we need to have that. We don't need to have lasers. We don't need to have surgery. And so it's about educating. And so I thought, you know what, with my skincare line, what I want to do is I want to start educating people. I want to start training them on what is proper ingredients, what is proper skincare. And, um, so with doing that, like if you were to go online to, to look at products, it will pop up that I'm not getting your email information or whatever else to spam you. I'm getting it so that way we can make a consultation or an online consultation. Because for instance, I had um, one of my RT members, his, his wife called me and was having issues with her skin. And I, 
I was talking to her about it and she's like, well, I'm getting eczema and psoriasis. And I'm like, well, what is your diet like? And so she went over her diet and I said, it has nothing to do with your skin. It's mm -hmm. that you have, um, you have candida or you have this going on in your, your intestines. So it's about teaching people what they need to know properly. And so I'm going to start doing webinars. I'm going to do a webinar for men and webinar for women, just focus basically weekly on educating. And I think that's where it comes from. I think if you're more educated, you know what you're doing, you know what you're putting on your skin, you know what you're taking internally, and you know if you go see a doctor and you want to have laser treatments or Botox or anything like that, you know exactly what you should be doing and not what they're trying to sell you. So let's let's take that piece of the conversation and flip it to the to the to the business side. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there's some interesting things with inside the consumer behavior, mm -hmm. and her angle of your angle. I'm saying I'm talking to you like you're not standing here in front of me, but your angle of education is incredibly valuable, and this is why people who are highly educated about a particular subject, number one, they spend more. Mm -hmm. That's right. It doesn't matter if it's wine, cigars, shoes, jewelry, doesn't matter, food, name it. If you know more about it, you, you um, move up the stack in terms of cart value, right? So when we're talking about value as a business person, like, look, there's, there's two parts to your business. There's, I want to do good, right? Absolutely. I have an area of expertise and I want to do good. That's one side. Fantastic. The other side is I have to feed my family. I have to have a business. I have to, right, make some money. You can do both, mm -hmm. not one or the other, both. Best businesses are built by doing both. Okay. So that being said, if you educate your customers, they spend more money. Not only do they spend more money, they spend more money more often. Yep. Right? Um, so, so number one, that is critical in terms of creating a nice, robust business. Number two, wealthy people complain less. People who spend more on their items complain less. It is a urban legend that wealthy people complain more than poor people who buy inexpensive items. I'm sorry that that comes across callous, but the numbers are what the numbers are. People who buy inexpensive items complain far more and it's much more of a customer service hassle than people who spend much more money. People who buy Rolls Royces don't complain as much as people who buy Kias. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just the reality of things. So if you're the business owner, one of the things you want to do is you want to mitigate your customer service issues. How do you do that? You offer an exceptional product. Guess what? Any exceptional product. I don't care what segment it's in. It could be steak. It could be skincare, shoes, wine. It doesn't matter. It is going to cost more. Mm -hmm. An exceptional product always costs more than, than the, the baseline or the, the cheap item. The people that if you're providing best education and you're providing the best product and people are paying a premium for it, believe it or not, you have less customer service issues, which means you have more margin and less stress in your business. If you take nothing else from listening to Jen talk, that is critical in building whatever piece. One more add on to that. Gary V, right? Very famous entrepreneur, all over social media, business guru. Everybody knows how he started wine library, right? So he started a YouTube channel called Wine Library TV. What did he do on Wine Library? He didn't sell wine. He talked about wine. He educated his client base on what wine was. Mm -hmm. Educated, educated, educated. Now Wine Library as a business without Gary involved does north of 200 million in revenue a year, right? There's a lot of value in what you're building and, what you're, and how you're going about it. The trick is doing it mm -hmm. over and over and, and over. I am telling you, it is definitely, and that's why I say this to everybody, you know, you want something quick and it's taken me 21 years to build up the clientele that I even have right now in, right. in my clinics. And um, even with our electrical company, like we treat our staff differently. They're our family. They're not called employees. They are called team members. And we, we value everybody's opinion. And we work it in that angle. Like we're all working together. And the same thing with the, the skincare that I'm doing, you know, it's, I am on Facebook every single day, probably three to four times a day, writing up really good um, 
just engagements with people Mm -hmm. and getting on LinkedIn and doing the Pinterest. And, you know, it's like a full-time job just to do that alone. A hundred percent it is. That's where (laughs) it is because it's, you have to engage with people and you have to get involved with people. And I feel like with the skincare clinic and my knowledge of nutrition, it's that I've created, not knowing that I guess I created it, it just happened, is when people want something, they come to me and ask me, Hey, you know, like for instance, with the shutdown, I have people call me, Hey, where can I get Botox during the shutdown? Or, Hey, where can I get this during the shutdown? Or it seems that when you're that person that everybody wants to call because they're like, Oh, Jen will know that I'm going to call her. Right. That is valuable. That's incredible. I, so hold on. We got to stop and talk about this for one second. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I, because it is incredibly valuable. So how I got my start, uh, I worked in finance. I effectively sold mutual funds, asset management to financial advisors. So yeah. my clients were Google, Boeing, Merrill Lynch, UBS, right? So very educated people around the market. And how do I differentiate myself? Because there's all these smart people and I'm a knucklehead. So how do I do it? And so what I did was, I wanted to know not only everything about my product, which I assumed was the lowest minimum standard is knowing everything I could know about my own product. Everyone expects that. That's not impressive. I needed to know everything about everybody else's product. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was being successful when my clients would call me about other people's products, whether they should buy it or not. Mm -hmm. And I would give them an honest answer. There is so much value in that, that I was able to grow my business uh, so much that I was in the top 10% of my peer group every year for a decade, right? Consistently. It wasn't just a one hit wonder because I consistently was able to be the person that Jen is talking about right now, where you were the resource. People go, "Mm, Pierre will know, Mm, Jen will know and pick up the phone. There is so much value in that. If you are not that person now in whatever your niche is, fix it, do it, it. no excuses, be that person. So, so I'm kind of talking about you in the third person, but Jen, you posting all the time and and putting so much quality into that content and helping people builds this sort of silent momentum over time. There's reputational capital that builds like a snowball. It takes a long time, right? It's all about patience, but if you play that long game, it comes to fruition. So for the, for the single parents that are out there, for, for the, the, the parents that have gone through divorces, have children and are trying to build a business and everything is coming down around them, Jen's story is incredibly inspirational because from a woman's perspective, she just told you about going through some very difficult times personally and professionally. And any normal person would have quit and she didn't. She chipped away chipped away and now has built up a very successful business and now is building a secondary business on top of that because apparently her appetite for work is never ending. Um, And that is such a great story because, you know, we have, I I know people, men and women who are, who've gone through difficult journeys like you have, who just feel, oh, I'm in my thirties or I'm in my forties or and I haven't accomplished what I want, or I'm not where I think I should have been. I deal with that to this day. I mean, mean, I'm going to be 41 in like a month. And I think to myself, I am nowhere near where I thought I would be right now. Right. Right. But the point is, is where you are in terms of your path or you're on track, I should say, your percent to goal, as as, as we would say in my old business, you're on that spot, right? And, you know, I'm going to make it about my podcast for one second here in that we try to have people on the podcast of all different spots in their journey. We've had people on here that are literally three months into their business. And we've had A-listers, A-list celebrities on the podcast. We had Ludacris and Marco Andretti on four days ago, right? And everybody in between, because there's value in understanding each and every step. That's what people need to get out of Jen's story, right? Your story is different because you're, you're not at first base anymore. 
you've rounded first base, you're cruising into second and you got an eye on third base and you're going, okay, I, now I can see it, right? And a lot of people stumble just, just getting off that first leg. Yep. Um, okay, so now you're in a great space. Believe it or not, that was the fastest hour of my life. Uh, we've actually been on the phone <laughs> for an hour already. Um, where are you now? Where can people go to learn more about you and, and understand everything that you're up to? Yeah. Tell the people. So um, I have my Instagram, which is called um, The Skin Chick. And um, it's so, I mean, I, I do everything on there. I mean, I'll talk about electrical. I'll talk about skincare. I'll talk about, um, I'm trying not to talk about politics, even though sometimes it throws in there a little bit. <laughs> slips out, slips out. <laughs> and then I have my Instagram. It's called Virago Studio. And those are my studios. Um, but online, you can go, it's vskincareline.com. Super right. easy. So V for me stands for Virago. So I came up with Virago a long time ago. Virago stands for a brave warlike woman. And so I created a men's line as one of my first launching, which is called V men's line and um, incredible products, but it's V skincare line.com. And then my IG and my Facebook is just Jennifer Carrasco. And then um, I also have my pages online, the V skincare line. Um, and then I also own Roseville Rockland Electric. So electrical, we do everything commercial, residential. We're actually building a Hilton out in San Jose right now. Oh, fantastic. So my son's out there for the whole week. Yeah, it's a bit of a that. schlep. I, I actually <laughs> used to live out that way. So okay. uh, in, in, in the Roseville area. So yeah, uh, oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. I lived, yeah, I, lived in, I lived in Granite Bay, actually. Okay, so okay. Next yeah. neighborhood over. Yeah. Um, but yes, beautiful part of the world. But San Jose is a schlep. It is not, it is not short. So uh, by the way, everybody, we're going to have all of that in the show notes. So you don't have to remember everything. I just and click on the show notes. So I'll be there. For my dog. He's very high maintenance. <laughs> I see he's that. an English bulldog. And he, if I'm, every time I'm on the computer, that's his cue to start this. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I get it. I get it. You're good. I want to say thank you for being on the show today. This was a lot of fun. Um, thank you for being so candid and open with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Your journey and, and story is amazing and, and it's just getting going. So I'm excited to check in with you uh, over the coming months and years and, and see how it's grown. So thank okay. you for being on the show. For everybody thank listening, thank you for joining us. From Jen, this is Pierre. There is no try. See you next time, everybody. <laughs>